Hey everybody. Uh, tonight we are going to look at my open top 20 long. I just made a few new additions to it. I put my Madagascan rainbow fish in there and I also put some water sprite in there. I floated it as you can probably tell by that big mass of roots hanging down right there in the middle. So we're going to look at this for a little bit and we're going to talk about RO water and what reverse osmosis is and how all that stuff works. Uh, in a little bit we're going to go and actually look at my RO system and then we're going to come back and we'll probably look at a different tank for a little while while we discuss the different uses for my RO water. I get questions fairly frequently about why I don't use my RO water uh, as the main water in my tanks and that will become clear in time. But before we talk about reverse osmosis, let's talk about osmosis and make sure we're all on the same page and understand what the process of osmosis is uh, before we start worrying about um, that process in reverse. So, to best describe osmosis, imagine the tank you're looking at, if it had, uh, right down the center of it, if there was a semi-permeable membrane. And this membrane would allow water molecules, and maybe the very few smallest of dissolved solid molecules go through, but nothing else really could pass through it, only water. So on, let's say, the left side of, well, first of all, if we started with the tank just as it is and we put a divider down the middle, that would be considered what is known as an isotonic state. The amount of dissolved solids would be evenly distributed on either side of that membrane. The water would be the same specific gravity or density, however you want to look at that. There would be the same amount of dissolved solids on the right side as there would on the left side. So now let's take a scenario where we've added a bunch of mineral salts to the left side. Now you're in a situation where the left side has a very high concentration of dissolved solids and the right side of the tank has a very low concentration of dissolved solids compared to the left side. So the left side is now what we call a hypertonic solution. It's a higher density of dissolved solids in it and the right side would be considered a hypotonic solution where it's a lower density of dissolved solids. So what's going to happen now is it's going to try to balance out but since the only thing that can pass through that membrane is water you're going to get water molecules from the right side of the tank, the lower density side of the tank and that water is going to start moving through that membrane into the left side of the tank to try to dilute that water. It's going to try to make it the same density as the water on the right side. Now you might be saying to yourself, well now that doesn't make sense because the water on the right side of the tank is going to get lower and lower and lower. Is the water on the left side of the tank going to get deeper and deeper and deeper as it, the water moves over? And the answer is yes, it will. You will start to see the water drop on the right side, the freshwater side or the lower um, density solution will get shallower and shallower while the left hand side of the tank with the higher density as water moves in it will actually raise the water in that tank and in this scenario I suppose it would start flowing over the top of the tank and overflowing but you would actually get a difference in water that's how much pressure is caused and of course the more dissolved solids you had on the higher density side the more pressure would be created and the more water movement you would get. That's basically why plants will die if you put them in salt water or very hard water. They won't live in very hard water aquariums for the same reason. It makes more dissolve solids outside of the cells in their roots than on the inside. It puts them in a hypertonic solution and what happens is the moisture inside the cells of the roots start leaving to go out into the water to sort of dilute it. It moves into the area of higher density. So you basically dehydrate the plant. The more salt water you put on it or the more hard water you put on the plant, the more you dehydrate it. The exact same thing happens with fish. If you put a fish that's meant to be in very hard water and you put it in very soft water, it has a higher density of dissolved solids inside of its cell than the water outside of its cell. And what happens is all that water floods into the cell and the cell ruptures. If you take a very soft water fish and you put it into very hard water, it's the same as putting a plant in salt water. All the moisture that is inside the cells of that fish that is now in this hypertonic solution, 
the moisture is going to leave the fish and try to go into the area of higher concentration, which is the water outside the fish, and you will actually dehydrate your fish to death by putting it in water that's too hard for it. So that, in a nutshell, is the reason water hardness and osmosis and osmoregulation is so important within your aquarium and understanding how all these things work. So that is basically the process of osmosis. That's how osmosis works. Water will move through a semi-permeable membrane from an area of lower concentration of dissolved solids into an area of higher concentration of dissolved solids. So what is reverse osmosis? Reverse osmosis is where we simply use mechanical force and we just shove water through a membrane and scrape all the particles off of it. We basically push water through and nothing else can pass through. And what comes out the other side of the membrane is water with much, much lower um, dissolved solids in it. So you're actually moving it the other way. You're moving it from an area of higher concentration. You're moving the water into an area of lower concentration but it's an unnatural process and does require external mechanical force to do this. It's a very costly process for the end product and it's a very wasteful process as far as water goes. If you're in an area where you're very limited or restricted on water, an RO system is probably not something you want to think about. For every one gallon of RO water you get, you run three gallons down the drain. It's a very costly process to get RO water. And what you get on the other end of the process is water that has been reduced in dissolved solids by anywhere from 90 to 98 percent. So this does not mean, contrary to popular belief, that you just get pure water, that everybody's RO water is the same as everybody else's RO water. Running it through an RO system does not magically give you this end result of RO water. It gives you water that's been run through an RO system. Your source water is going to determine what your end product water is. If you live in an area that's got extremely hard water and tons of dissolved solids in it, let's say you've got hard water and you've got nitrates and sulfur and silicates in your water, and you've got 900 parts per million coming out of your source water, if you run that through a high quality RO system, you're still going to come out with anywhere from 90 to 20 parts per million dissolved solids on the other end of that equation as it goes through this membrane up to 10 percent and that depends on the quality of the membrane it depends on how new the membrane is um, there's a few other factors involved in that. It depends on what the dissolved solids are. Um, sodium can pass through one of these membranes fairly easily compared to a lot of other dissolved solids. So in a situation like mine, where I have water that's gone through an ion exchange system and I have sodium ions in my water, as they push through the RO system, I probably have a tendency to allow a few more dissolved solids through my system than if it was, say, a hard water system uh, where the calcium and the magnesium would get blocked out much more effectively than the sodium. So even what your dissolved solids are is going to make an impact on what your end result is and the only way you can tell that is by having a TDS meter. You check your source water, you check your RO water, you do a little bit of simple math and you can find out how effectively your RO system is removing dissolved solids from your water. You can even use that to tell when you need to put a new filter on it because you'll notice your dissolved solids start climbing because more and more stuff is getting through this filter. Um, as it gets clogged it actually doesn't filter better, it filters worse, and you'll actually start getting more and more dissolved solids will start bypassing it uh, and getting into your end product as the filter gets closer and closer to be needing to be changed. Um, so you can simply keep an eye on it by spending $25 and getting yourself a little TDS meter and checking your RO water, checking your source water, etc. Test your water, test your water, test your water. I always test your water. So let's go over and have a look at the actual system itself and I will show you how it all works and then we will come back and we will talk about the uses of it and what it's good for and what it is most definitely not good for because there's plenty that RO water is not good for. All right, here we are at my familiar uh, water treatment area. And we're not going to get into a lot of what all of this stuff does. This has to do with my uh, pH stabilization, my neutralization, my biolite, my 
um, ion exchange, nitrate resin, etc., etc., is all over here. Uh, what we're going to concern ourselves with is from here over. This is my pressure vessel that gives me my household uh, water pressure of up to 60 psi. What happens from there is the water goes up and it goes into this system. And this is a four stage basic RO system. This is not an RODI system, and we'll get into that in a few moments. This is just an RO system. And we go through four different filters. I'm assuming that they are progressively smaller and smaller, uh, and we get down to the final filter. The water then goes out and through this line and you can see where that split is that goes up through the floor. That runs up into my sink area next to my coffee maker so I can use RO water to make my coffee in the morning if I so choose. The other line comes back down here and goes into the smaller pressure vessel and that is basically the pressure vessel just for my RO water so I'll always have up to three gallons of pressurized RO water uh, at my tap upstairs. But what I do is I bypass that and I keep the valve closed so that that system does not fill up and I run it down this line into here where I have another valve that allows me to open or close what goes into my 65 gallon reservoir. So let's go back over and look at another tank and we will talk about what I actually use this water for and why. All right, now what we just looked at was your basic RO system. That's no frills um, and it's not an RODI system. An RODI system is an RO, a reverse osmosis, deionizer. And what that does is that removes those last few little dissolved solids I was talking about. Um, if you've got the most best system you can get, and you've even got some very soft source water, you know, some very low dissolved solid in your source water. For example, my neighbor has about 35 to 40 parts per million dissolved solids in his groundwater. It's astonishing. He has water that's so pure, discus could probably live in it without issue. Uh, yet his well is maybe 500, 600 feet from mine, and I have almost 200 parts per million dissolved solids in my water, and about 80 of those are nitrates. So I've got water that needs treatment as it comes out of the ground, and that's why I run it through the type of system I run it through. No matter what kind of water you've got, no matter how pure it is, it's going to have some last few remaining dissolved solids once it goes through any RO system. The deionizer is what you could think of almost like a magnet. You've got these last few little charged particles, these ions in the water, and they get stuck to the magnet as they go through the deionizer, and it pulls those last few little things out. And what you're effectively left with at that point you may as well call it distilled water. It's pure H2O. There's no dissolved solids at all in RODI water uh, once it's been run through the system properly. Now, what is that good for and what is it bad for? Um, it's bad for a lot. It's If you use pure RO water, especially RODI, uh, you, you can't just fill a fish tank with that and put fish in it. They will die. I would imagine, I don't have any experience with them personally, but I would imagine even wild caught discus uh, could not live in even really pure RO water. They would need some dissolved solids added back into the water after that. Uh, as far as RODI water, I'm sure they couldn't live in that. Most bacteria cannot live in pure water. It's not even electrically conductive. Electricity cannot live in pure H2O. So RODI water is, or RO water in my case, in my case I'm left with about 11 parts per million dissolved solids in my RO water. That's as next to naught as makes no difference as far as I'm concerned. My RO water is pure water. I've got 11 parts per million dissolved solids in it. Um, that is no big deal to me. Now what I use that for is two things. I use it for top off water and I use it to make up my brackish water. 
Now the reason I use it as top off water is because as the water evaporates out of your tank you're basically distilling it down. None of the dissolved solids that are in your tanks, whether they're nitrates or whether they're mineral salts, whatever they are, they stay in your tank and only the water molecules evaporate. So if you're taking water from your sink or your source water that's got dissolved solids in it already and you add them to your tank and then some more water evaporates out and then you add more dissolved solids to your tank you're distilling the water down and you're concentrating the dissolved solids in your tank and you're gradually increasing how many total dissolved solids are in your tank depending on what's in your source water will depend on what you're building up in your tank <coughs> excuse me so by using the RO water I'm not putting anything else in the tank I'm simply replacing the water that leaves. Now in my case I am also putting 11 parts per million TDS in the water but that's really not a big deal and considering even my most warm open top tank only gets topped off maybe two or three times between water changes I'm not really adding much in the way of dissolved solids to my tank. So that's the main thing I use my RO water for is simply topping off tanks as I go around. The other thing I use it for is mixing up my brackish water and anybody that has a marine tank knows that you always want to start with RODI water, uh, especially in a marine tank where you might have very sensitive corals or very sensitive animals where just even a slightest shift um, in specific gravity can be life or death to corals. Um, but you want to start with water that has nothing in it and you want to build it up from there. I've likened this before, I, I call this my cake analogy. Um, if you were baking a cake, you would not put ingredients into a mixing bowl that already had some unknown amount of ingredients in it. You, your recipe would come out wrong on the other end. You would empty the mixing bowl and then you would put known quantities of flour and sugar and baking soda etc into it so you would get the correct recipe on the other end. If you're using tap water and you're adding salts to that you're effectively taking a mixing bowl that's already got some unknown quantity of stuff in it and now you're adding your ingredients on top of that you're not going to come out the other end with an accurate recipe you've got to start with an empty mixing bowl and that's what the RO or the RODI water is you're stripping all the stuff out of the water you're emptying the mixing bowl and then you're putting the minerals and dissolved solids and salts back in that you want in the amount and volume you want. So those are the two most beneficial things you will use for uh, your RO water, at least in my case. Now if you do have uh, fairly hard tap water but you don't have nitrates in your tap water the way I do, you can do a 50-50 mix and then, or whatever depending on how hard your water is and depending on how soft you want it you can make a blend of your hard tap water with the very soft RO water and you can again come to a final recipe of where you want your water but in order to do these things you're going to need some basic test equipment which I always promote people buying you're going to need a general hardness test kit which will also come with a carbonate hardness test kit and you're going to want a simple TDS meter it's a very useful tool it tells you a lot of information once you begin breaking down what all the information means and how it applies to your tank and your situation. Very handy little tool to have. But that's the only way you're really going to know what's going on with your total dissolved solids, with your RO water, with your African cichlids or whatever. You're going to start with your stripped down water and then you're going to build up or you're going to do your mix of tap water and RO water to come to the end result that you're looking for. Now in my case I have people ask me why do you use your softened water which contains a lot of sodium ions instead of just using your RO water. Again, I can't simply use RO water. You fish won't live in RO water. I actually did in the tank we're looking at, and that's why we're looking at this tank. Uh, I had eight Cynodontis petricola in there, um, which is an African lake fish, but can tolerate neutral conditions and fairly soft conditions, down to about five degrees of hardness. The sodium in my water accounts for about five degrees hardness, sort of. It's not the same, but it's a similar substitute. I'm not going to get into that now. So one day I decided I was going to do what everybody suggested and use a bunch of RO water in my tank. And I only did about a 50-50 mix 
and I killed seven of those eight Petricola. I killed four of the angelfish that were in the tank, and about six other fish that were in there at the time died uh, because I put a 50-50 mix of RO water back in, and I softened that water up and reduced the amount of dissolved solids in there way too much, way too quickly, and I paid the price, and I learned my lesson. Uh, RO water, uh, despite what a lot of people seem to think, is not just this great water. Everybody seems to think, like, you know, the purer the water, the better, no matter what the circumstances are. And that's just not true. Most fish can't live in very pure water. You don't want pure water. When you hear the term pristine, pristine is not the same as pure. Um, you can have tannin stain water, you can have black water that is considered pristine. Pristine means it doesn't have any pollutants in it. It doesn't have any nitrates and phosphates, um, things that are going to affect the animal's osmoregulation in a negative way or affect its health or its kidneys. That's pristine water, but you can have very high dissolved solids in the form of nitrate or in the form of um, tannins and still be considered pristine water. So that's not the same as pure. Uh, this idea that like, oh, putting fish in RO water is just a solution because you'll have nice pure water doesn't work. So what I would have to do would be mix my water with the RO water anyway, but my issue with my water is not that it's too hard. My issue is that I have nitrates in my groundwater. If it wasn't for the nitrates, I'd have very soft, slightly acidic, it'd actually be about 6.6, .6, and maybe without the nitrates, I'd have maybe 100 parts per million uh, TDS in my groundwater. I'd have very nice South American, you know, Amazonian water coming out of my ground. But I have about 80 parts per million nitrates because I live in farm country, and apparently my, the aquifer I'm on, rather than my neighbor who has almost pure water, uh, we're clearly on different aquifers. So I'm stuck with these nitrates in my water regardless. So if I were to use half groundwater and half RO water, I'd be loading it up with nitrates right out of the ground. So I have to run it through this system that takes the nitrates out of it. And it basically does it with this ion exchange medium. I go through my neutralizer, which is also an ion exchange medium, and it leaves me with about 180 to 200 parts per million uh, sodium ions in my water, which is not an issue. It is for some fish in some conditions, but I know it's there, I understand it, I know what's going on with my water, and I know what fish can and cannot deal with my water. So I actually have it set up so I can use my water right out of my tap, and then my RO water is used for my incidentals. It's used as my top off, it's used as my brackish water, etc. So I really do have a rhyme and a reason behind why I do the things that I do and it all does make sense once you start putting all the pieces together and understanding how this works in correlation to that and so on and so forth. So I hope that makes it a little more uh, easier to understand and dispels a few myths about how RO systems work and what RO water does and why we use it in our tanks uh, and so on and so forth. So please leave any questions or comments down below. I always welcome them. Uh, please subscribe if you're not already. I always do a wide variety of different videos. You never know what you're going to get. And if you are subscribed, of course, I thank you already. And I thank you for watching this one. See you real soon on the next one.